And before we get started, uh, allow me to introduce our speaker for today. His name is uh, David Ng. He has extensive experience in the derivatives industry. So formerly, David was the head of marketing in Philip Futures, leading the marketing team in growing the derivatives industry. So currently, he is a full-time proprietary trader with Iceberg X uh, Sundaram Berhat, uh, which is a local proprietary trading firm in the local futures market. So without further ado, let me pass the presentation to David. David, the stage is yours. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you, Sirai, for the kind introduction. Um, before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, Bursa Malaysia uh, and also Excel to invite me to speak on this platform. Um, I think it, this will be the third series uh, you know, uh, on speaking on, on the derivatives market. Uh, I think the first two series I touched on uh, fundamentals as well as technical aspects um, you know, on, uh, on trading the derivatives market in Malaysia. Um, so I thought it would be good that we can conclude that series, uh, you know, with giving you the skill or rather um, the experience of being a full-time trader. Um, so the title of this webinar is called The Journey of a Full-Time Futures Trader. Um, the reason, the, the keyword is journey. Um, for every, I, I think if you are involved in the trading, uh, you know, trading, if you're involved trading, uh, whether it's a part-time or full-time basis, uh, you need to recognize that, you know, doing trading, if you're doing it for a full-time basis, it's really like a journey. Uh, there's, there's no destination they are waiting to, to arrive for. Uh, it's not like a short-term trip that you're taking. It's, it's a pretty much a journey that you're going through uh, in different stages of your life. So um, I, I think it's, it's good that I'm start off the tone of this webinar uh, by giving you a little, uh, along the ways, I'll be just sharing you my experience uh, when trading the futures market in Malaysia. Uh, you know, being a full-time trader uh, in this market. So as usual, uh, I think it's good that uh, whatever Metro is here is presented here is purely for educational purpose. Um, so any opinions, any recommendations is purely based on my own opinion. It doesn't reflect opinion um, by Excellent or even by the Exchange Bursa Malaysia Directive. Um, so it's purely based on my own opinion. And, you know, dealing with futures, dealing with any leverage products involve a lot of risk. So make sure you know, you consult your licensed representative, uh, you know, uh, before you engage in any of the uh, contract, uh, any of the uh, products itself. Um, so make sure you're well educated, you know, speak to the right person uh, before you start your journey uh, in the market. So I thought, you know, I think the way we're going to approach this webinar for the next uh, hour or so is, you know, I, I'm, I think it's good that since the last two uh, sessions we covered on the product itself, looking at things technically and, uh, and, and fundamentally, it's good that we uh, kickstart one part uh, of trading, which is psychology. Um, now, I think trading psychology is very critical. Um, if you ask me honestly, how many percentage of success is attributed to psychology? Now, different people will have different opinion, uh, but I would say it's definitely more than 50%. Um, so the success of a trader is very much depending on the psychology of him or herself uh, in tackling the market. Um, you know, you must understand, you know, uh, trading is not an easy journey. Uh, this is where I like to put forth the disclaimer. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, whether it's, you can call it myth or mis, misconception, um, that trading is an easy, uh, is an easy uh, avenue or easy endeavor. Uh, far from the truth. If you, you know, if you just look at the success rate in the market, how many of the Trader, you know, after the simple way to gauge is how many of the traders are still trading after six months. If um, I can tell you the percentage are very low, um, and that's the fact of the market. Um, I think the reality of the thing is, is it's really down to the psychology of the trader. Um, if he or she doesn't have a very strong psychology to handle the market dynamics, uh, you know, that is going to be make or break for the particular trader. So I believe that psychology is an important area. Uh, and you know, if you are new to the journey, if you're thinking to embark on this uh, journey in your own, uh, make sure that you must uh, understand a little bit more in depth or pay attention more towards psychology part of trading. And I think that's very crucial. Um, so I, I think when it comes to trading, I simplify it uh, when it comes to processes or, or rather the whole uh, gamut of trading into four Ps. Um, you know, we are very well familiar with four Ps in the business process, whereby you talk about people, place, you know, process platform. Um, so in trading world, there is also a four piece, uh, which I'm going to touch on later on. 
Um, and I think it's good that towards the second part of this webinar, I'm going to be touching a little bit on uh, good, a bit of a refresher on some of the key things that to look at, uh, you know, whether it's forming a trading plan, uh, looking things at fundamentally and technically, uh, and also ways to actually trade the market. Um, so that will be the second part of the webinar. So let's kick start with trading psychology. Now, um, you know, in trader in the trading world, there is a lot of type of traders that's in the market. Um, some may call them, oh, I'm a fundamental trader. Fundamental traders are usually traders who always base their decision, uh, trading decisions based on, on data, based on research that they have conducted, or uh, even you know, reports that they have read. Um, so it's very fundamentally driven, uh, very news driven, very uh, market research driven. Um, technical traders are very common. Uh, and in fact, majority of the traders right now you see in the market, uh, most of them are technical traders. So technical traders are mainly those individuals who you know really look at market uh, charts um, you know as their key avenue to make a decision so whether it's it's looking at moving averages looking at candlesticks uh, regardless i think that's the key decision when it comes to um, making trading decisions so technical traders are traders who look at charts only um, then obviously we have other categories like scalpers uh, you know scalpers are traders who always look at you know uh, trying to make that one tick trying to make that one point profit uh, in and out very frequently. Um, now, in a very dynamic market, that makes sense. And if your transaction cost is low enough, uh, scalping can be a very good uh, opportunity or, or place to begin with uh, if you are someone new to the journey because uh, scalpers are, are, they are always very fast in, very fast out of the market. So that means your risk is very minimal. Um, you, don't, you don't expose yourself to the full swing of the market. Uh, but having said that, you know, scalpers, you have to be aware of the transition costs. Uh, if transition costs are high, I think scalping or scalpers in general, you'll find it very difficult uh, to, to earn that kind of revenue. Now, day trading are also very common nowadays. So day traders are usually traders who always hold a position more than a day. Um, so normally, you know, traders, uh, they tend to, if they see a certain chart pattern or they notice that, you know, uh, there's, there's news coming in from the market, um, they will have to hold a particular position more than a day. Sometimes it could be days, sometimes it could be weeks. Uh, in fact, sometimes it could be no later than a month. So that's how day trader, you know, uh, really trade the market. So usually they hold position overnight. Now, position trader is slightly, it's quite similar to day trader, but position trader are more focused towards holding a particular position. They have a conviction. Um, so for a simple fact that uh, if, they, if they have their own view, they, they did their research, uh, they realize that the CPU market is going to go higher. Um, so they're planning to hold for more than a particular, more than a week or so, uh, hoping to reach the target price. Um, so position trader are more towards a medium to longer term basis. Uh, and, you know, these are also fairly quite common. Um, so event driven trader, you know, um, if you are someone like trading CPU market or even trading FKLI, uh, you know, you notice that some traders, they like to trade on event news day. So, for example, if you are trading CPU market, you know that you know every ten or a month we have the MPOB report, which is very crucial, uh, and mar market is very sensitive to that. So, anything that change in the report, it will definitely change the direction of the market. So, there's traders who just trade on that particular day because they love that kind of volatility, um, and you know that's that's where even during trader are, are more focusing on. Now, the last group of trader is as mentioned here is the algo trader, algorithmic trader. Now, this this uh, group of traders is actually getting uh, more prominent. Um, and in fact, I think recently with the advance of technology, uh, computers are getting more advanced uh, and the processing power is getting more. Uh, you know, this type of trader is actually getting more popular uh, in the market. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, um, they start off as discretionary trader. Discretionary trader meaning you make your own decision without the aid of a computer. Uh, every buy and sell decision is made by you. Uh, and I think slowly these people will also transition towards the systematic trading or, or, or rather, you know, um, more mechanical. Uh, and that's where algo traders are also coming into the market. Um, so really, I think this, uh, this group of traders are slowly getting more prominent. Uh, and it really depends on individual at the end of the day. Um, so wherever you are, if you are new in the journey, you know, um, it doesn't matter which category or type of traders you are, ultimately the main objective or the main goal of a trader is to sustain the market and to make money. I think that's the key thing. Um, there's no point, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, just just to get just just to be in a particular group or just to, uh, you know, restrict yourself to a group 
to a type of trader. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, your PL doesn't show. I think that's that tells a lot. So these are the general types of trader that is uh, in the market. Um, so it really depends down to individual. So which choose your comfortable level as to which uh, type of trader you are, depending on your risk preference. Now, um, I think importantly in any aspect, uh, regardless whether it's, it's, it's an endeavor that you are planning to go through, uh, trading is similar as well. Um, it's, it's a very tough endeavor. Um, so importantly, with, with every task at hand, before you even take the journey, you have to ask yourself a few very relevant questions, um, especially um, you know, if you are transitioning towards, if you have been doing trading for on a part-time basis and you want to do it on a full-time basis, uh, really there's a lot of questions that you need to ask. Uh, and the first thing, first and foremost, is always ask, what's the reason you're doing it? Um, and that's where it relates to your trading goals. Um, now, the reason why I mentioned this is important because um, later on when I share with you the journey of a trader, um, it's, it's not a straight line journey, mind you. The journey of a trader is never a straight line. The journey of a trader is always up and down. Um, it's more critical for, um, for a trader is what is he or she going to do during a down period. Uh, and that's where a lot of traders will always fall back to the, uh, the main reason they are in the market in the first place, which is down to their goals. Um, so importantly, if you are thinking to start your journey in trading, identify what's your goal and purpose. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you more than 90% of every individual who start the journey in, in trading is the main goal is always to say to make more money. Uh, but I can tell you, if you have that intention in the beginning, it's not to say right or wrong. Uh, it's a fair enough good statement, but it will not last long. Uh, because, you know, market is, is like I said, it's never a straight line. Uh, and the journey is never a straight line. So uh, I think importantly, identify your goals. I know the goals always is about making money, but there's other goals that's also quite relevant on why you need to stay on this course. Uh, and that's equally very important for you to identify first before you start your journey. Um, then I think obviously, you know, uh, a lot of people when they talk about trading, they want to put their hands uh, half in first, which is let's do it part time. Uh, you know, probably you are doing a full-time job uh, and after that, you know, um, I decided to, okay, you know, since, I, since I've been seeing a bit of result, why not I go full-time? Now, before you make that transition, like I said, mention, uh, importantly, identify your goals. Without that, really, you are just putting yourself too much of uh, exposure and at the end of the day, you know, the risk of you failing is very high. Um, so, really, I think first thing is identify what's the purpose and your goal. Um, second thing I think is really if you start off with a part-time basis, um, start for a while uh, and eventually if you think you have the confidence to do it, make that leap uh, because there's no point because I've seen a lot of um, some of my friends that, that, that have been doing this business, um, you know, they start off part-time uh, but they never make that leap to doing it full-time. So eventually you know, their results has been fairly, uh, it's actually deteriorating and eventually they give up. So that's a very common route. Uh, for traders who, you know, who always stick into a position, they are comfortable with it, they are not making that leap. Um, so I would say, you know, um, if you are new, start by doing part, uh, doing it on a part-time basis. Uh, and once you are ready enough, if you think you're comfortable enough and you have the confidence, transition it to a full-time basis. Um, now, um, I think, you know, if you ask me, you know, um, and... I've been also reading this, I've been seeing it with my own experience. Um, there is certain characteristics uh, that a successful trader always possesses. Uh, now, if you if you are some, if you are an avid reader, if you look at some of the traders that is trading in the US market, uh, you know, those successful traders, um, you notice that they always have these certain attributes or certain characteristics that always with them, uh, you know, that eventually they will success in uh, they, they will succeed in trading. Um, I think one of the major characteristics that I can identify with is, um, you know, being a trader is like a being someone that is is learning the market, uh, and you know, in school you want to you want to succeed in a school, uh, in school or you want to get the first place is that you always have to have the hunger and the desire to learn. Um, same goes in trading. Um, you know, we start off as someone that's learning the market. Um, if you start off the journey as someone that's hunger and have the desire to learn, uh, eventually I think the market uh, will, will be rewarding. Um, I think that's one of the key attributes 
uh, I would say, when it comes to, you know, um, trying to be successful in this market. Um, so really, I think it's, like I said, it's a journey. Um, even though you think that you have learned enough, you have gained enough experience, the market will one day will, will always teach you that, you know, you probably have not learned enough yet. So that's where, you know, it's important as a trader, if you're going to for the long time, uh, for a long term basis, uh, you need to have the, uh, the desire and the hunger to learn uh, throughout the whole journey. So now I think the goals of a trader, you know, these are all very personal. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, I, I would say, you know, majority of the people who come to this market, they always think that, oh, my, my personal goal is always to make money. Yes, true enough, who doesn't want? Uh, but really, I think sometimes we also need to think out of, uh, I, I think, take a step back and think about other perspective or other aspect to trading that really, what you really want. Uh, for example, you know, if you, again, you look at some of the uh, examples of successful traders, um, they are in the game, not for only for the money, but they are also really in the game because they have a passion for the financial markets in general. Um, so I think really that's also set apart uh, traders who fail and traders who su succeed in the market. Um, so I think, again, you know, um, really goals is always the key thing, the first step we need to do. Uh, when you determine whether you want to do this full time. Now, uh, I like to classify trading, uh, or, or rather I like to put the aspect of trading uh, to a similar aspect to aspect of doing a sport. Uh, if you look at it, I think traders in general are like a, like a sport performer. In, in fact, even the psychology of a trader is very similar to sport psychology to a certain extent. Uh, keeping in mind, you know, uh, a trader always uh, you know, have to be in the market with the same composure. So for example, if today you are trading the market, the market doesn't favor you, you lose a lot of money, uh, you have to compose yourself, the next day you have to come back to gain that market. Now, this is not an easy task. Um, emotional breakdown, emotional psychology is what weighs a trader down. Um, you know, if you, I have never seen people so far, you know, people who lose money, they don't feel any impact. Uh, it's very rare. For sure, as a human, we always feel the emotion uh, bearing on us. Um, and that's where I would say is very similar to sports psychology to a certain extent. Uh, in, a, in a way, whenever we have down days in trading, uh, we really need to make ourselves make ourselves uh, compose in terms of emotion uh, and be ready to fight back the market the next day. Because you know, if we are not able to compose ourselves and you know we let go of an important opportunity in the market, and that's an opportunity that's being left out. Uh, and it's very difficult for you to come back again in the market. Um, so I think trading is very similar to sports uh, in a certain sense, uh, in a way that the psychology that you need, uh, especially for elite performance, uh, in, especially look at the um, superstar uh, sports performance, the psychology uh, is very similar to psychology that you need in trading. Um, now, uh, you know, the key topic that I have today is the journey. Uh, I never mentioned you know, is is a trip, uh, and I keep emphasizing it's a journey. Um, keeping in mind, you know, um, if you do this, is you know, is 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 a step in. Uh, pretty much, is is going to be pretty uh, for your for pretty much for a longer term basis. Um, and this is where it actually separate a lot of traders. Uh, in a sense that the commitment level to become a full time trader it is very high. Uh, and especially you start up uh, in the beginning as a part-time basis, for you to transition over to full-time basis, it requires a lot of commitment. Um, first thing first, you must understand that do, if you're thinking of doing trading as a full-time basis, um, it requires a lot of resources. It requires you to commit a lot of your time. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of, uh, means, I would say in a way, means selling in the open market, whereby they always think that trading is so easy. Uh, you know, you just click the, with a click of mouse, you know, you can make so much, you know, uh, and the next month or so you can able to get your Ferrari. I can tell you that's far from the truth. Um, the market, it is highly dynamic now. Uh, and it's, I wouldn't say it's getting difficult, uh, but what it requires out of you is a lot of commitment and time. Um, so I would say, you know, if you trade this as a job, it's not an easy job to begin with. Um, so really, I think there's, there's no set of destination for a trader, but really it's a journey that the trader is going through. Uh, and importantly, I mentioned in the previous slide, um, you know, if you are someone that is having the attitude of learning uh, and keep on improving on a daily basis, eventually you will get there. Uh, and the most important thing is 
don't give up. I think that's that's equally very true. Um, so I think everyone will have different goals, risk tolerance, uh, for sure. Uh, skill levels are also very important. Now, skill levels I like to emphasize. Uh, a lot of people here will think that, oh, being a trader, you must have certain or you must have a degree in finance, you must understand economics, uh, you know, you must be very, uh, um, very uh, proficient in looking at technicals, charts, and all this. Now, that's far from the truth, again, um, for the simple fact that if you look at it, at the end of the day, you know, if you have more skill or rather more information, more education doesn't mean you, you'll make well in the market. Uh, in fact, when you have more information, uh, you always hear the word information paralysis. Uh, it can actually be harmful for you. Um, in fact, if you just look at, um, I, I'm not sure you, you, you read this book by uh, the Turtle Trading. Um, so they did an experiment um, you know, where they, they gather a group of traders from different backgrounds. In fact, uh, you know, the, those traders who don't have financial background, they did pretty well. So what this goes to show is that it doesn't matter what background you have. Uh, doesn't mean you have financial background, it helps you in the market. In certain ways, it helps, but on the longer run, everybody is the same. Uh, what's crucial to determine that is really down to, you know, the psychology, the attitude, the character of that individual that can really make the difference. Um, so I would say, you know, um, skill level and experience, uh, it does matter, uh, and but educational background, knowledge of the market doesn't really play much difference. Um, and as a trader, you know, we all, the main thing is to work on your craft uh, on a daily basis. So four piece of trading, um, I think like I mentioned, first thing, identify a purpose, which is your goal. Uh, once you get that, I think that's, you move on to the second step. Uh, now, I think with every arsenal of trading, like I mentioned, is a journey. Journey is a long journey. It's not a short term journey. Uh, and what it needs in, in going through this journey is the main thing is patience. Um, you know, a lot of people who join, who embark on this journey thinking that, oh, uh, next one year, I'm going to make my, I'm going to make enough money to buy my first house or make enough money to buy my dream car. Um, again, that's far from truth, uh, you know, and if market doesn't reward you in the next one year, a lot of people will just give up. Um, the key thing is really about patience, uh, keeping in mind, you know, market is, is not going to be in your favor 100% of the time. That's the reality of the market. Um, so that's where patience is very important. Um, perseverance. Now, this is, I would say, is a major thing. Um, a lot of people doesn't persevere enough. Uh, in fact, a lot of traders, when they go through uh, middle of a journey, they give up. Uh, I think that's where, you know, it really separate the, the real good traders and you know, uh, those traders who couldn't make it. Um, so the key thing is patience and you have to persevere along the journey. Um, last but not least, you know, trading, you must have a plan. Uh, whether it's executing your trading strategy or whether you're talking about uh, thinking to do this full time, you need to have a plan uh, in totality. Uh, and process is important. Now, why process is important for a trader is because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, every trader will, will, uh, will have a bad day. I've never seen a trader who doesn't have a bad day. Uh, it's important for a trader to, to, uh, to make sure what he's doing or she's doing during a bad day. And to, in order for, for a trader to do that, they must follow to a certain process or rather to a certain habit. Uh, and ultimately this relates to discipline. So a very successful trader has a great amount of discipline. If you have seen some of the great traders, uh, you know, you notice that these are also uh, one of major attribute is discipline in the market. Uh, whether it's discipline cutting loss, whether it's discipline in frame process, ultimately the individual is still disciplined enough. So that's, one important thing when it comes to determining the success of a trader uh, at the end of the day. Um, now, um, there's a lot of books outside on talking about um, trading psychology, um, but there's one specific book that I would highly recommend to the audience today is by Gerard Handler. Um, it's The Mental Game of Trading. Um, I think he speaks well in terms of psychology of doing trading. Uh, and it's important, a lot of people, a lot of traders who start off this market, they think psychology is not important. As long as I get my methods right, my system right, my execution right, I'm good enough. But that is only helping you in the beginning stage of your trading career. But what's helping you uh, going through the medium to longer term basis is really the psychology of, of the market itself. Um, so really, I think it's just a good book. If you have not read it, uh, I will highly recommend it uh, to take a look at it. Um, so you always specify this. 
um, he always classified his trades into mental games. Um, yeah, it's like A, B, C. A being the perfect trading uh, setup. B is always looking into a little bit of emotions involved. C is completely following your emotions. Um, so the way to determine the success of a trader is always make sure that you are always in the A game zone. Um, if you notice you are falling into like C or B game zone, make sure you pull yourself uh, into the A game zone environment. Um, so that's how, you know, uh, we really condition ourselves uh, when it comes to trading the market. Now, um, I mean, I'm not going to go too much on, you know, psychology issues of trading. These are all very common um, psychological issues, which all traders will, one, or, one, one way or another, will definitely face these type of issues. Um, I think the main thing for every trader that is outside the market is greed. Um, and, you know, you must understand futures itself or rather, you know, uh, derivative product in nature is a leverage product. Uh, leverage meaning that, you know, you act, there's high risk for high return. That's, that's the game of the, uh, that's, that's the, the game plan. Uh, but keep in mind, greed always comes into the mind of a trader. Um, so, you know, always make sure you always keep check of the greed uh, element. Um, you know, uh, again, if you put, if you push too much of a size in a particular trade, if it goes not in your favor, you get it. Uh, so that's where it's always important to make sure you control your grid by making sure you have a stop loss in place, uh, making sure you're comfortable with your position sizing. Um, so grid is a very natural element, uh, but a trader must control uh, its grid element before the grid can control the particular trader. Um, I think second thing is fear. Uh, fear is an, another important issue that every trader must address. Um, now, you know the common saying, uh, fear of missing out. Um, I think it's very true, um, especially when it comes to trading the market. A lot of people were saying that, oh, look, you know, the market is is uh, hitting all time high. You know, should I be selling? Um, again, like I mentioned it's a very difficult proposition to to be fighting against the market. Um, so there's always a fear element that's being involved. Um, a very good trader will always make sure that when it comes to a fear scenario. They have to recognize it and they have to uh, find ways to counter it. Um, so fear is a very common uh, perception. Um, but indeed, I think as a very good trader, you really need to counter your fears. Uh, for example, if you know if you are having fear of missing out, you know, try to be a bit more patient with your setup. Uh, you can't always be timing the, the, the cycles on the market. No one is perfect enough. Uh, but it's important for you to make sure that you don't jump into the market uh, too early or too fast because that's where you know easily you can get caught so fear element is something that you have to manage uh you know as part and parcel of your trading career um third thing is overconfidence now i get this part you know after hearing you know after being many years in the market and after uh, seeing people and hearing friends um, i think this pop this uh problem is, is very common um overconfidence now, a, a lot of traders who came to the market they always believe that, you know, the first bank of the first trick of the market, the first uh, trade on market always ends up with uh, uh, profit. And in a way, to a certain extent, that can be attributed to luck um, to a certain extent. So that's where when, you know, when the first few trades, they make money, they get a bit confident uh, and that can actually kill the trader. Uh, if you notice, I think a lot of traders who, who doesn't last uh, you know, more than six months or a year, uh, normally the first few trades they do is usually they make money. But the trade, the, either it's a fourth trade or fifth trade, when they take that, that's the trade that can that, that wipe off all their gains in just one particular trade. And it's actually down to overconfidence. Um, so really, I think as a trader, you really need to measure yourself uh, in terms of confidence level. It's very common uh, for a trader to encounter this, especially when you have a winning streak uh, you know, you have subsequent or your successive uh, months of profit and suddenly it gives you a great confidence for you to take a big position in the market. And once you do that, the market can just go against you. And that one trade can cause all your gains to be wiped out. I think it's very, com it's very common. Um, and overconfidence is something that, again, we need to address. Uh, and it's also down to a very psychological battle you're playing with. Um, because in trading, you need that confidence. But you can, you have to measure yourself. You can't be overconfident because once you step into overconfidence, uh, that's where you land yourself into trouble. Um, so make sure, you know, if you are taking trades, you measure your your emotional uh 
emotional cues, whether, you know, are you confident to take that trade and make sure you're not overconfident in taking that trade. So that's where a balance you need to play with. And it's a very tough balance. Uh, it all comes with experience in the market. It all comes with, you know, uh, how, how long have you been in the market? Uh, and that's what actually help, help you to make, to strike that particular balance. Um, now, last but not least, I think discipline. Again, this list is not exhaustive. I'm just um, saying you, um, just trying to find you out. These are some of the common you know, uh, psychological issues that's always, trader always face in the reality. Um, now, discipline, again, is, is a very tough, uh, uh, it's a very tough psychological problem. You know, humans are a creature of habit. Uh, and, you know, we tend to be very comfortable. We, you ask us to change, we are very difficult to change. Um, and, you know, discipline is something that we really need to make it into process to a habit. Um, like I mentioned earlier, during your down days, there's certain process you need to make sure that you, you compose your mental, uh, uh, mental psychology. Uh, whether it's, you know, during down days, you know, um, if you don't compose yourself mentally, uh, you can really break down the next day. Because imagine this, if you're doing this full time, the market is always there. Uh, you have to make sure that you are composed enough uh, to prepare for the market the next day. It's not easy. Uh, I, during my beginning journey in trading, um, I find it's very difficult, especially during the days that I don't make money. Um, and, you know, doing this full time, there's added pressure on you. Um, so that's where you need to, to stick to a certain processes or certain routine to make sure that you're able to compose your psychological mental uh, for you to prepare to fight the market again the next day. So that's where discipline will come in handy. If you're disciplined enough to make sure you follow certain uh, processes, certain habits, uh, to make sure yourself are composed again, uh, that's where discipline is important. So now I mentioned Jared Tender, you can obviously look, uh, look him up uh, on Google. He has a spreadsheet, he has a website that's very useful. Uh, he has a lot of very good resources when it comes to uh, handling emotion, uh, trading psychology. In fact, he has a couple of worksheets that I, I'm actually, in fact, I'm using it uh, on and off. Um, so these worksheets are important. So I mentioned like the psychological issues, uh, fear, overconfidence, greed. Um, these are all emotional triggers. Um, so it's important when, you know, the first step we need to do is acknowledge it, to recognize it. Uh, and once you acknowledge and recognize it, it's important for you to record it down uh, and take steps to measure, to control those uh, emotional cues. Because from then on, in, the market will never understand your psychology. The market doesn't care about your psychology. Uh, at the end of the day, it's only you in your control. Um, so that's very important for us to make sure that we, we measure ourselves in terms of uh, how strong our emotional cues or how strong uh, our psychology is affecting our traits. So that's, it's a good to have a spreadsheet in order for us to really measure ourselves, uh, you know, during the times of uh, extreme fear, extreme greed, uh, or especially when markets are very volatile these days. Now, um, I, I think can't say enough on discipline. Um, you know, I, when I first uh, came into full-time trading, uh, I find it very difficult to have discipline. Uh, imagine, you know, the market starts at, at like CPO market, the market starts at 10.30. Doesn't mean that you can wake up at 10 and and, and just prepare for 30 minutes. Um, the pre-preparation for the market is, is actually a lot of work. Um, so, you know, if you are training uh, CPO market, you know, technically you, you awake earlier, you need to get data, you need to understand the market, what's going on overnight in Chicago and whatnot. So there's a lot of preparation into it. Um, so it all downs, it, it, it boils down to discipline that you have. Um, now, I think in terms of processes of a uh, trader is important uh, and sticking to that process is also equally important. Um, that's why I mentioned one of four pieces is plan. You must have a trading plan um, and sticking to that plan is also very crucial. It's a make or die for the particular trader. Um, no, that's why I mentioned stop loss is something is a must uh, and the discipline of sticking to that stop loss, it is something very uh it's part of a disciplined nature of a trader. Uh, if, a, if a trader doesn't have a particular discipline, he doesn't follow his trading plan in place, uh, doesn't, doesn't execute his stop loss when the market trigger, he's pretty much gone. Uh, and I think that's, if you look at some of the feedbacks of why a trader doesn't, uh, doesn't, success, doesn't succeed in a particular market, it's always down to you know, not having a discipline to ensure that cut loss is being in place. Um, and 
I would say, you know, pretty much the battle of the market is actually battle of emotions at the end of the day. Um, so I would say discipline is a major thing for a trader. Um, now, a lot of people will say process is important. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, uh, during as a journey of a trader, people will start off with having to do backtest. Uh, you can backtest as much as you can. You can do on a simulation account. But the reality of the matter is you need to start once you're comfortable enough, you need to start having, uh, putting real money into real account and start trading. Um, you know, it's, and one of the major thing about uh, a trader is people are so, um, you know, so lured by the profit potential. They only care about, oh, I want to make a certain amount of money, a certain quantum, a certain uh, amount. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the success of the trader depending very much on the consistency of the trader. So it doesn't matter whether you can make that kind of money or whether it could be just a one time off. You never know. The market is just dynamic enough. But what's important is that you need to have the consistency in making it uh, day in, day out. Uh, and that's the way to separate between a good trader uh, and the trader who doesn't succeed. Um, so I think one way to ensure consistency is discipline. And I've seen this uh, fairly enough as well. A lot of traders will start off with putting a lot of effort into their simulation account, uh, you know, running back tests, uh, but eventually they don't take, they, they don't trigger anything on the, the actual market. Um, again, this is down to fear. So like uh, there's a famous saying by Mike Tyson. So everyone has a plan for sure. Everyone has a trading plan. Uh, you know, uh, the, whether the plan will succeed or not, you have to wait until whether they'll get punched in the face. Um, so that's, reality of the market is as well. So you can have a perfect plan. You can execute well on a simulation account. Uh, you can run good uh, results on a back test uh, data. Uh, but really the, the bang or the buck is in the reality of the market. Um, so eventually you can't stay too long uh, doing simulation. You can't stay too comfortable in doing back tests. Uh, you really need to also get hands-on in the market. Um, so the journey of a trader, um, I, th I think importantly is, you know, when you're thinking to identify your plans and goals, uh, make sure that you need to recognize the individual that you are. Um, you know, if I mentioned, you know, humans are very creature of habit. We are very comfortable when things are very uh, certain. Now, a trader, their main job is to trade in a certain market. Market is never certain. Um, there's no such thing as a certain market. Um, so generally, when you are going into an uncertain market, Jenny, you'll be very fearful uh, and you'll be very, very uncomfortable. Um, so the real learning for a trader is to make sure that you are able to cope in an uncomfortable situation. So I just have to share with you this iceberg I uh, ideology. A lot of people are so allured by uh, the trading because what they see is always the tip of the iceberg. They always see the success story of every trader because most of the traders always tell you, oh, I, you know, I definitely will always share with you success story. If you ask me, uh, why do you, willing to share my, uh, you know, uh, my failure stories. I think a lot of people will be very hesitant to share. Uh, but I, if you look, just look at the ideology of the iceberg, a lot of people are so focused on looking at the results, but they don't understand the processes actually underpin those results, um, just like the iceberg. So the iceberg, you see the tip of the iceberg, only you don't see the underneath of it. Um, so same goes for trading. I think trading, a lot of people are seeing the results of the success uh, that they have gathered, but they don't, understand the process that they have to go through, uh, especially for those uh, successful traders. I, the amount of work, the amount of commitment, um, the amount of uh, pressure they, are, they are, have to battle with uh, is, is tremendous. Uh, and in fact, there's a study that shows that, you know, the amount of pressure in doing trading is, sub, is almost equivalent to doing a, a surgery. Uh, that's how pressure we are. Um, so really, I think, you know, always make sure that you, you always come back, uh, you know, to what's your main goal of doing this in the first place. Um, so financial capital and mental capital, um, I, I mean, these are more relevant in, um, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I have this amount of money, go and start off in trading, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to be fair enough, it's, uh, I'm hoping to do well. Um, keep in mind, I think financial capital is important, but what's more important is mental capital. Financial capital can only last you uh, a certain amount of time, but mental capital is what keeps you going. Um, the important thing for a trader is always ensure you are consistently 
making money. There's no point in making a one buck shot. Uh, there's no point hitting a jackpot in, in one instance uh, by hitting all streak of losses the next. So the important thing for a trader is always make sure uh, he or she is consistent throughout uh, the whole journey. Uh, and that's more important. Now, um, this emo emotional cycle of change is so very interesting. It's also uh, propagated by Gerard Tender. Um, now, I'm not going to go too deep uh, on this uh, different stages. Um, you know, you can obviously read it from the slide. Uh, but what is important to identify is, you know, regardless any stage you are in, importantly is you need to recognize where you are at. Um, for example, if you are, for sure, everyone, if you start off uh, in the beginning of trading, you'll feel very elated, very happy, uh, especially when you, the first few trades you make, uh, you, you, you enter the market, you make money. Usually, you know, most of the traders will feel very happy, very elated at that point in time. Uh, but usually this is what we call false optimism. That will not last. Whether you can attribute that as luck, uh, you know, um, again, it very much depending on the individual. Uh, eventually, a lot of people will go down to what we call the second stage is informed pessimism. So the first time when they hit the first few trades, they make money. After the subsequent few trades, they lose money. They feel like giving up already. This is very common. And in fact, you look at it, why statistics have shown, you know, if you talk about uh, 10 traders that's out in the market, I would say 90% after six months, they pretty much close their account. The reason being is because they started off well, they make money, but they couldn't continue momentum. And when market strikes them, that's when they see the kind of pessimism that they are, they are having, they quickly get out of the market and they finally quit from the market. Uh, and at this stage, usually a lot of people will quit. Pretty much 90% of people will quit. Um, and what differentiate between a successful trader uh, from a particular group is to overcome uh, that particular stage in their emotional cycle. Uh, if they can overcome that, I think pretty much, you know, you are pretty much in for the run. Um, so eventually, you know, once you overcome the biggest downturn in, in, in your emotional cycle, uh, you know, uh, and you start building up your confidence again, uh, that's where they start to see the result. And normally, a lot of successful traders, they will, once they overcome uh, the lowest stage in their emotional cycle, uh, pretty much they are pretty much in the run. Um, so stage one and stage five is usually talking about optimism. Uh, that's where you start to see trading success. Now, um, one of the key things about 4P is being patient. Um, now, I can't emphasize this enough because a lot of um, people are not willing to put in the time, the effort, uh, and they don't see the direct results. Um, you know, you must understand the market is, again, not always rewarding. Uh, there's no hundred. There's no one strategy that can fit the market or that can execute the market well 100% of the time. Um, I wish I know that kind of strategy. Uh, but the key thing about trying to be success in this market is to make sure you survive. And one of the major things to survive in this market is that you need to have patience. Um, you know, there's always a time, there's always a time or point in the market where it's going to be favoring you. And during that time, you need to recognize it, you need to be sensitive about it, and to make sure that you really you know, hit the market hard. That's what they're saying is. Um, but throughout the whole journey, you could just be waiting for that one particular trade. Uh, but that is enough and that's sufficient. So especially like the type of traders you are in, especially for those position trader or day trader, normally you wait for setups. Uh, you can't be trading every five seconds or every five minutes because there's no point. Your transaction cost is going to be high. Uh, you know, I mentioned scalpers are very sensitive to transaction costs. So if you are not in those categories, uh, if you are taking positions only like, like uh, you know, waiting for signals in the market, the signals only come like probably days. Uh, and that's where you really test your patience. Uh, and as, as a trader, you're almost like a hunter in the, in the jungle. You need to be sitting, waiting patiently uh, for the market to tell you the signal for you to execute. So that's where I think patience is very important. Uh, and it's one of the major four Ps. Um, now, I like this saying, if you're going to cut down a tree, you spend 80% of your time sharpening your axe. If you are going to trade, you spend 80% or 80% of your time waiting patiently. So I've seen traders who always stare at the screen. Uh, they they don't mind to do that because they just want to wait for the particular point where the market is telling you, oh, that's the right signal to take. Uh, and that may be hours, maybe days, maybe sometimes even weeks. But when that signal comes, they hit it well. So that's where you know, as a trader, the major attribute you need to have is patience. Um, and it usually takes many years to build a career in, actually, in fact, in anything. 
Um, so same goes for trading. You don't expect, you know, you do this for one month or so, you're going to be very successful. Um, like I, if that's the case, I think everyone will be a very successful trader. Um, you know, and everybody is different. There's no such thing as, you know, oh, my friend did it in, in three years, he's a successful trader. So give me three years, I'll be successful as well. Different, you know, different individual, different journey. Um, so really, I think it takes years. Uh, in fact, sometimes it could be decades to really build a career out of trading. Um, so, you know, ultimately, just be patient. Now, I get this a lot. It's trading an art of science. Now, it really depends. Um, but I will say, you know, I would tend to lean to the answer that trading is more of an art rather than science. Um, for the simple fact that you just look at how you manage your strategy, how you manage your emotions are all, are all quite creative. Um, again, humans are not fixed in terms of their emotion. One day you can feel happy, one day you can feel sad. Um, market is vice versa as well. Market is also very dynamic. Doesn't Market doesn't always tell you, oh, right now it's going to go up. The next second is going to, it's going to go down. Um, so really, I think, you know, in a sense, trading is, is pretty much like an art uh, rather than science. You can't objectify everything, uh, you know, especially when it comes to trading. Psychology is something you can't objectify. You try your best to make it objective, but there's always an element in it that, that is pretty much a, uh, a creative by nature. Same goes for the market as well. You tend to objectify by looking at data, looking at charts, quantify certain formulas. But the market itself, the patterns, the waves are also quite creative in a sense. Um, so really, I think for, for my view and my opinion, trading is pretty much uh, an art. Um, so if you're a trader, you, you want to trade in this space, think yourself like a painter. Um, you know, you think of ways um, you know, for you to, you know, really navigate the market because you need that creativity, especially when it comes to facing the market. Market is never static. Um, that's why those algo traders, uh, they may be doing well for one point in time, but when market scenario changes or market dynamics changes, they'll get, they'll, they'll get beaten as well. So that's where you really need to understand the nature of the market itself is actually quite creative in certain ways. Now, um, success rate, this is where it's quite controversial. A lot of people will say, no, um, the success, everybody comes to trading the market is going to be successful. Uh, the reality of the, the matter or the fact is uh, that's not the case. If that's the case, then everyone's job is going to be a trader. Um, now, whether it's 90%, 95%, I think that's right, quite close to market statistics. Uh, you know, it's, it's very natural to assume that, you know, uh, out of 10 individuals who come to the market, only one or probably sometimes two uh, individuals will only succeed uh, to, to find success in the market. So that's how the nature of the success uh, of a trading the market is. Um, obviously, it's not easy and there will be. That's why I think a lot of people are quite skeptical on really making that leap. Um, but that's the truth of the matter is. Um, and it's, it's not an easy and they aware. You know, everybody will be thinking, well, this is it's going to be easy money. It's never that. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, like I mentioned, it's actually one of the hardest for passion. Uh, you, you can compare the stress level as to almost uh, someone that's doing surgery. I think that's where, you know, people are attributing it. Uh, but really, I think success rate, uh, if you look at the regular matter, is you're only talking about 10% um, or even less than that. So that's the nature of it. Now, um, I'd like to touch a bit on risk management. Um, I think a lot of traders, um, they tend to look at or really quite focus oriented on Know, trying to think about how ways to make money, but they never uh, make an effort to understand that uh, one of the attributes to be successful in the market is to make sure you manage your risk. Uh, there's no point of hitting the jackpot, but you know, your, your risk management is like down the roof. It, because trust me, the market will one day wipe off all your gains in just one particular trip if you let your gut down. Uh, that is why risk management is very critical. Um, so I think risk management is way underrated. Um, so if you are thinking to start your journey, um, you know, make sure risk uh, control is one major element. There's no point of you know setting high uh, target profits, high profit targets uh, without uh, inputting the proper risk measurement in place. Um, so obviously you can, some of the matrix that you need to have when you are starting your journey is make sure what's your risk per trade, what's your reward to risk ratio, uh, and what's your hit rate. Uh, once you get this right, once you get your matrix right, you're comfortable with it, that's where you should be looking at in terms of managing your risk. Um, I like to emphasize this because a lot of people get it wrong. 
uh, they always emphasize, oh, I must make sure I must make this amount every month. I must make sure I must uh, hit this profit target. There's no point, uh, you know, to expose yourself to so much risk if your risk is not controlled well. Um, so, like I mentioned uh, earlier on, the journey of a trader is not a straight line. It never is. Uh, in fact, a lot of people start off with expectation that, you know, oh, along the years, you will grow better, like a straight line curve in the journey. Um, that's what you expect. But the actual reality is it takes, uh, you know, everyone's journey is different, but normally you start off, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you don't see that result in the first few years. Uh, and that's where you really test your physical, your psychological barrier. But once you get through that, once you build that consistency, once you build a confidence level, eventually you will get there. Uh, but it's a matter of time. I mentioned every individual is different. Some could take years, some could take months, some could even take decades. Um, so that is important to recognize. But the key thing is the journey itself is not a straight line. It's more wheat and sauce. There's a lot of up and down. Uh, what's important is throughout the whole journey, you have the kind of mental attribute or uh, the certain characters that can pull you through, especially uh, in during your darkest period. Um, so that's pretty much on psychology. Uh, and I would say, you, if you ask me honestly, I think that's the most important area that you really need to put your focus on when it comes to trading. Um, no point to putting so much emphasis on fundamental or technical or other aspect when it comes to execution of a trading strategy, because psychology is what controls uh, the decision for you to click the mouse. Uh, whether it's greed, whether it's fear, whether it's overconfidence, is what really drives you in making that decision. So importantly, you need to recognize that. You need to make sure that you control those emotions. Um, so I just thought of uh, putting the fundament, fundamental aspect and technical just to put a refresher for some of the audience here who probably have missed the other two sessions. Um, so I think you just look at CPO. If you are someone that looking into fundamental aspects, these are some of the factors that actually affect prices. So I'm not going to go too detail on each of them. Uh, but actually really down to, if you just look at things fundamentally, it's demand and supply. Uh, so as long as a high demand, uh, you know, low supply, prices are going to go up. Um, high supply, low demand, you know, naturally prices are going to come down. Um, so trading CPO market, or in fact commodities, the reason I like to trade commodities in certain ways is because there's always a pattern. Uh, if you notice like CPO production, you know, it always is a nice pattern. June to September, October, usually the period production will increase. Uh, and just to let, if you understand Economics 101, when production increase, normally that tells you that it's actually time for uh, for prices to come down. So that's very natural. Um, again, you look at it, uh, production this year looks like it's going to go slightly on a high end. Uh, and I think that's why prices has actually been doing uh, around 4,000. Uh, so that's where sometimes it's good to understand why the market is driven until this kind of price. Uh, but again, it, whether it helps you in trying to predict the future, it may serve as a guide, but ultimately, if you are trading the market, you need to be in the market at that point in time. Now, uh, I hope this helps. If you look at CPO market, if you compare that with uh, the actual stock levels in the market, you notice that CPO prices tend to react negatively with uh, stock levels, which means that if stock levels starts to rise, then usually palm oil prices will, will move uh, inversely. So true enough, I think you can see, you know, uh, pretty much here, um, whenever you have high stock levels, price will tend to be lower end. Um, now, I think recently, I think you look at the news, Indonesia has been trying to flush out their stocks uh, into Malaysia. I think that's very pushing prices uh, down. So I think that's quite news driven. So if uh, someone is trading the market, this kind of news that's coming into the market uh, on a daily basis can actually affect uh, prices. So if uh, someone that's a news trader, uh, you just have to be very sensitive to all this type of news flow. Now, if you look at demand, I think when you look at palm oil market, China and India are someone, I mean, two major uh, palm oil importers from Malaysia palm. Um, so I think China and India has been actually slowing down, uh, which is uh, quite surprising. Um, and if China and India is slowing down, you don't see prices going higher uh, because demand is not there. Um, so that's one thing to pay attention. If you are looking in the market in fundamentally, just look at China and India when it comes to their demand because uh, if they're not purchasing more, normally that tells you, you know, generally the market is not going to do well. Uh, but the funny thing is that I'm not sure why China and India is slowing down, but if you just look at stock levels, 
uh, it seems that you know the stock levels in both countries seems to be quite low at the moment. Um, so that's where I think you know it's quite puzzling why China and India is not buying more. But eventually, I think they have to buy because the market, uh, their stock level situation is actually quite low. Um, again, I think price, the why price collapse from six thousand to four thousand we have seen in in previous months because the export has actually been quite weak, and if you just look at production, it's expecting to go up. Uh, so with that in mind, I think you know fundamental wise for CPO looks like it's going to be more on the bearish side. Um, now palm oil in Indonesia is again very different scenario. You have a you have a country where there's so much of stocks, and they, they just do whatever means that they can to flush those excess stock in the market. As a result, Malaysia is suffering that. Uh, so right now you look at the market in CPO, you really can see a lot of pressure. Uh, from Indonesia, uh, and I think they really push, trying to push uh, as best as they can, whatever stocks they have. Now, if you are someone that's training a palm oil market, you must also look at soybean oil. The reason being is because these both markets are interrelated. Uh, there's a spread between both markets, uh, and normally the spread usually trade about 150 US dollar. The funny thing is that the spread now is doing about 600 US dollar. Which is very expensive. This tells you that the bean oil is actually way more expensive than palm. Uh, it's actually good news for palm. Uh, so eventually, if you are someone that's thinking that this spread will narrow, uh, it's actually about time. Uh, given time, this spread will eventually narrow. When it narrows, that tells you that either soybean oil is going to come down or palm oil is going to go up to close the gap. So do watch out. I think this spread uh, might tell you something if you are trading the palm oil and bean oil market. Um, I'm going, not going to go too much on this forward curve because it can complicate things. Uh, but what is important to take note is that if you compare uh, all the prices in the futures contract on BMD, if you just plot their prices, uh, it tells you quite a good picture on where the market is going to hit. Uh, whether it's contango or backwardation, that's too technical. Uh, but important to understand when the curve change, especially from contango to backwardation or backwardation to contango, that usually tells you that the market is, is telling you something, whether it's oversupply or there's tight supply in the market. Now, I'm, I, like I mentioned I like to trade commodities because it's quite seasonal. If you just look at this table, uh, you notice that you know June to September or in fact August period, normally market won't do well. Uh, in fact, I think August we probably will close at the low. Um, now, you look at it, November, December is where CPO tend to be very strong. So if you are someone with this kind of uh, information, you tend to use it as a way for you to aid your analysis. So if you go, if you're approaching November, December period, uh, you should be thinking of, oh, okay, if, if there's a short term uh, bearish uh, movement, I should be thinking to take an entry to long. Because historically speaking, these are the periods where prices tend to be stronger. So that's how you use seasonality to actually make a decision. But again, these are all historical. Whether the market will follow historical, uh, it depends on what this current situation is. But if, if it's taking precedent from historical uh, performance, uh, then usually end of the year is where you start to see stronger prices. Um, CPO is, it has been a very volatile period this year. Um, I, I think those who are trading the market, um, you know, you, you tend to get a lot of excitement. Uh, and it, I, I tend to a bit differ, you know, with the common opinion that when volatile markets are there, uh, traders will like it. It actually depends. If you're someone that couldn't capture the kind of volatility, uh, then technically you prefer lower volatility of the market. So again, it depends on strategy, the risk tolerance, uh, and certain and certain other factors. Uh, but nevertheless, I think market has actually already already done a fifty percent retracement. Um, I think it's about time where market will tend to form a base. Um, so watch out. Technically speaking, I think palm oil probably could be forming a base around this level. Uh, and eventually, when you head over towards the year end, uh, probably we start, we should start to see prices uh, going higher. So that's on CPO. Um, FKLI, uh, if you are trading the index, is a different set of factors that's actually, uh, you know, uh, affecting prices. These are all fundamental factors. Um, again, these these are not exhaustive. There's uh, no tr to trade the FKLI market. Um, sometimes it can be very tricky. You know, there's always a saying that. You know, when other regional markets are down, Malaysia market can be the only one that's going up. If you just look at the past two days, it's quite evident, you know, when Dow Jones is down by a thousand points, our FKI market is actually quite robust. In fact, it, it was the only one that closed higher in the region. 
Um, so again, I mean, trading FQI requires a lot of uh, different set of uh, analysis of factors that you need to use whenever you look at the market itself. Um, now, I think one key thing is being an index market is very sensitive to foreign shareholder. If foreign shareholders are not in the market, uh, usually there's no one supporting the market. Um, if foreign shareholders are in, usually you know, they tend to see some support. So the key question is what drives the foreign shareholder in the market? Very simple. If US interest rates are continue to be hawkish, they continue to go up, that's, and Malaysia interests are not fast enough to capture that, that differential, a lot of people will just leave our markets and go into a higher interest markets. So that's, where, well, that's what fund managers do. Um, so really, I think there's a lot of drivers to foreign or uh, why foreign shareholdings are, are participating in the market. One key thing is always interest rates. Now, being a Malaysia index, very commodity driven, uh, we have palm oil, we have crude oil. Um, so obviously, you know, the index itself is very sensitive to crude oil. Uh, and this year, I think crude oil performance has been quite strong. Uh, if you look at the uh, comparison uh, of both the index itself, the comparing FQI and crude oil, you can clearly see that when the crude oil uh, starts to increase, uh, we can also see the same goes for FQI. But recently, I think that relationship has probably a bit uh, uh, weakened off. In fact, I think crude oil is, is riding on its own big rally, but FQI doesn't seem to really that much. Um, so really, there's a lot of factors that actually attribute why FQI doesn't follow that kind of performance. Um, now, same goes, it's not only crude oil, you look at Dow Jones itself, um, FQI to a certain extent does follow the US market, but there's instances where it doesn't follow. Just like the classic example I've shown you earlier, uh, last, uh, I think it was yesterday. Uh, in fact, I think we closed in the high, uh, the only one that closed high in the region. Um, now, I think if you look at uh, trading FQI fundamentally, a lot of people look at Ringgit. Um, now, when you have a uh, strong ringgit normally is, is when you look at the performance of FQI, it's, it may not be that beneficial. But when a weaker ringgit, uh, normally, you know, the index will actually be weaker. If you just look at the historical relationship, because a weaker ringgit, that means outflow. Uh, and that means foreign shareholders are out of the market. Um, so really, that, then you can see that, you know, whenever you have a weaker ringgit, you know, FQI tend not to perform. But when you have a stronger ringgit, normally you start to see strength in the index itself. Um, now, again, there's periods where this relationship doesn't hold. Like I mentioned earlier, the FQI is actually very much driven uh, on its own set of fundamentals. But these factors actually helps to explain to a certain extent what are the certain factors that actually can impact uh, the FQI prices. Um, so I think going, going to the last part, um, so once you have the fundamental perspective, uh, it's good to have the technical as well. And technical is what drives your decision to enter and exit every single time. Um, you can't be waiting for, oh, ringgit is going to hit this, I'm going to be longing the market. Uh, that will take ages. Or, or wait for the supply to, to come down. That's where I'm going to long CPO. That also will take months. Um, so what really drives your decision on a daily basis, always down to technical setups. It can be other ways of looking at it, uh, but a lot of traders, majority of traders will use technicals as a way to guide them to enter the market on a daily basis. Um, so I just want to share a very briefly plan that I, I tend to use uh, when look at both the markets. Um, first thing is trend trader will always look at it and try to identify the trend. Um, if it's an uptrend, downtrend, or sideways market, they'll use different set of strategy. Uh, but they always trade with the trend, not against the trend. Um, timing the market ups and downs is very difficult. Uh, your success rate is going to be very low. Um, so keep that in mind. So one way to determine the trend is to look at the 200 uh, period EMA. So as long as prices are trading above 200 period EMA, uh, it's an uptrend, below is a downtrend. Uh, if the EMA line is going sideways, that means the market is actually trading sideways at that point in time. Um, secondly, being a trend trader, um, you know, we, I tend to use Haken Ashi as, as one way of looking at trends. Um, Haken Ashi is slightly different from candlesticks. Is derived from the Japanese candlesticks, uh, but in the sense that Haken actually can point the trend direction in much clearer fashion compared to using a Japanese candlesticks. Um, and having all this in place, it's also good to incorporate moving average crossovers uh, as a way to make sure that, you know, if you look at a bull, uh, bullish candle on Haken actually, uh, if you have 
also a bullish crossover moving average that will confirm the signal even more. Uh, last but not least, make sure you have stop loss management. There's no point having all this in place, but you don't have stop loss. Like I said, market is never always going your favor. There's, there's always a point in time when market will go against you. And that's critical to make sure they have a stop loss in place. Um, so visually, you can obviously identify trend by looking at higher highs, higher low, uh, lower highs, lower low. These are all high, uptrends and downtrends respectively. Another way to look at it is to plot a 200 period EMA. So as long as prices are trading above the 200 period EMA, that means the price, uh, the market or trend is going higher. Uh, so this is for CPO. You notice that it actually broke back in May, early May, it broke the 200 period EMA. So that means the market is actually on a downtrend. So if you are someone, a position trader, you can use the 200 period EMA as a way to gauge. You could be putting a stop loss uh, in your positions. Uh, once you cross the 200 period EMA, uh, you should be out of the market because that's generally the long-term trend on the market has changed. Um, so true enough, I think the market, the long-term trend market for CPO is still on a downtrend because it's trading below the 200 period EMA. Now, um, just to show you, uh, there's two charts here, same time frame, same product. Um, no, there's one type A and type B. You notice that if you're a trend trader, you always prefer type A. Reason being is because it's so easy to see. Uh, red colored candle bars is, is telling you a downtrend. Green colored candle bars are telling you an uptrend. Um, if you look at type B, you see a lot of different signals. You see sometimes green and red together. Uh, you're not sure whether is this a downtrend or an uptrend at this point in time. So actually type A is what we call Haken Ashi. Um, so Haken Ashi is a derivation of Japan's candlesticks. In a way, it illustrates the trend in a clearer manner. Um, it's unlike Japan's candlesticks, it's also very simple. You don't have to remember all the doji, uh, you know, uh, morning star, all the different configuration that you have uh, in candlesticks, Japan's candlesticks. Haken actually has only three type of patterns. Um, so really, I think it's, it makes, in a sense, easier for you to see the particular trend. So in a bullish trend, you see a lot of green candles. Uh, in a bearish trend, you see a lot of green, uh, red candles. And in a sideways market, you see a series of red and green. Uh, and if you see the body of the candle is getting very long, that means there's momentum in the trend. Um, so if you are a momentum trader, that's where you need to be in the market uh, by looking at the Haken Ashi candles. So some example on using Haken Ashi. So it, here you can see this period or this uh, period where the Haken Ashi shows you red candles and the body is actually getting longer. So that's momentum in the downtrend. Uh, so that's a very good signal for you to pick it up to short the market. Um, and careful, if you are looking at a trend in the market, you need to notice when the market has start to die down especially when it comes to trend. One way to see is that when you start to see series of green and red candles together, that tells you actually the market is probably going to be in a sideway range uh, market. Um, so I mentioned, I think Haken actually uh, alone is not enough. You can put in uh, moving average crossovers. Uh, one way to do that is to put two types, uh, two periods. One is a shorter term period, one is a longer term period. Uh, in this example, I'm using a nine period and the longer one is 20 period. Um, so crossovers are simple. If the long, if the shorter term is crossing uh, below the uh, longer term, that means the market is probably going to head downwards. But if the shorter term is crossing above, that means the market is probably going to go higher. And if you incorporate another signal by looking at Haken Ashi, if the candles are green in a bullish crossover for the EMEs, that means the market is probably going to hit on a steady uptrend. So what I have here is a classic example of a short-term market, a short-term down market. You can clearly see there's a bearish crossover. Here you can see the shorter term crossing below the longer term. So it's probably the first signal you get is going to be a bearish crossover. And true enough, you get a red Haken Ashi candles, and these candles are actually quite long body. So that tells you that actually there's a momentum in the downtrend. So that could be a very good position for you to be executing a short signal uh, on, on the market. So that's how you incorporate moving orange crossovers together with Haken uh, to create a trading plan. Um, so another example is looking at the bullish crossover. If here you get a bullish crossover on your EMAs and your green Haken Ashi bars are showing you that the market is probably going to go into the uh, uptrend. Um, so that's where you also could be positioning uh, for a long strategy uh, in this setup. Um, so FKLI, another similar setup you can, you can use as well. 
Um, here we have a bearish crossover whereby the shorter term are crossing below the longer term, uh, and the red head can actually bars is present. So when you see a red head can actually bar with a bearish crossover, that's quite a good signal for you to execute a short in the market. Now, last but not least, risk management is important. There's no point going to the market without proper risk management. Uh, one way of looking at risk management is to use an indicator called ATR, average true range, is available in, um, you know, in most of the trading platform. Um, so ATR will tell you like what is the common range uh, of a particular market at that point in time. So right here, what I have is the FKLI market, and on this time frame, this particular time frame, uh, the ATR rate is four point five. So what you see here is that you see a red head can actually, uh, so that possibly you can tell you probably the trend might change from because before this it looks like an uptrend, but it could be exhausting at this point in time, and the clear signal is to wait for the EMAs to uh, to to cross each other on a bearish crossover. So if the EMAs are crossing bearishly uh, and the red Haken energy bars are red, that's quite a good signal for you to short the market. Um, so again, how do you set a stop loss? If you're thinking to short at this point in time, it's about 1,500. Um, the target profit is 14.91, which is about nine points. How do I get that? It's simple. 4.5 is your ATR value. If you work out the reward, risk to reward ratio one to two that means you know you should be looking at nine points as your reward 4.5 points as your stop loss um so nine points is is at 14.91 and stop loss level is about 15.05 or uh you know 1504.5 to be exact so that's how you position uh your stop loss level according to the atr value so keep in mind if the market is getting more volatile your atr value increase that means your risk buffer or your potential stop loss is going to be bigger so that's where you need to be careful um so again this is on cpo market again the atr value is slightly on the higher end 100 points um so here we have a very good short uh, setup you know uh, assuming you, sh you short a position at 4000 uh, and you work on the reward to risk ratio 2 to 1 so you're looking at about 200 points as a profit and 100 points as a stop loss so using ATR as a way to manage your risk is actually very good. Uh, so you don't get stopped up you know, that easily as compared to having other different type of stop loss strategy. Um, so gauging the efficacy of your trading plan is important. Uh, I'm not going to go too much, uh, too detail on this. You can obviously refer to the slide uh, after the webinar. Uh, but what is important is that you must have a record. Every trading plan you execute uh, and at the end of the trading plan, at the end of the trading day, you must record uh, your PL, your volume, your equity level, and all this because all these are measurement of your trading uh, journey. Whether are you going in the right path or going in the wrong path? Because if you're going in the wrong path, you can obviously self correct and make sure you are align yourself back into the journey. Um, so these are some examples of uh, you know, having a trading plan and measure your trading success. You know, um, Obviously, you know, the journey is not an, an one straight line up that is always up and down. Um, so same goes as your profit and loss scenario. There's always days where you make profit, there's days where you don't make profit, you make a loss. Uh, so importantly, in those days you make a loss, make sure you keep your losses small. That's the differences between trading success and trading failure. If you don't make yourself, you don't make sure you, you keep your losses small, your losses can go big and that's where you can get busted. So that's where um, you know, importantly, to make sure you keep your losses small. Um, so some great trading resources. Um, a lot of examples here in the psychology part, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the first part of the webinar, uh, is all from the book, The Mental Game of Trading by Jared Tandler. Uh, if you have the time, go and Google it. He has a lot of great videos on YouTube. Um, you know, do have a look at it. Uh, I think he's a very good uh, you know, um, practitioner or coach when it comes to mental psychology for trading. Um, obviously, there's other good resources. One Good Trade by Mac, uh, Mike Bellafore. I think it's also one uh, a very good book to read if you're new to trading journey. If you're someone new, you want to think, of, uh, you want to start your journey into trading, read that book. One Good Trade is a very good book to begin with. Um, obviously, when Club is also one good one, it's talking about more risk management. Uh, and I think Market Profile is also one another good book by uh, James Dalton. I think he, he's, he's, I think, pioneer when it comes to Market Profile. Um, so these are all some great training resources that you can obviously look at. 
uh, you know, you can obviously Google their books are available on uh, on the internet or on bookstore. You can go and get it. Um, so I'm just coming to the end. Um, so my final parting words is when you come to the trading on journey, uh, assume the risk that you are in. Uh, make sure you go through the four pieces which I highlighted earlier uh, in the beginning of the webinar. Uh, and uh, I like to, again, I have to reiterate to dispel the myth that uh, trading is never an easy journey. Uh, and a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's always a straight line. It's never a straight line. Uh, the journey of a trader is always a lot of ups and downs. Uh, and importantly, that you must have the mental resolute, uh, the robustness uh, to keep yourself going when times are tough. Um, so with that, I'd like to have my parting words from the great Master Yoda. May the force be with you um, if you are thinking to trade, uh, to start your trading journey in the market. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand over to Sivai for any questions from the audience.